This is the Business Experience Show, where we connect those who want to know more about digital marketing, social media, and business strategy with entrepreneurs who are succeeding in today's marketplace. Follow our blog, join our online network, or connect with us at thebusinessexperienceshow.com. And now, your host, Lisa Caprelli. Welcome to the Business Experience Show. I'm Lisa Caprelli. Also here with me is Brian Gaps. Here at the Business Experience Show, we are all about sharing business ideas and information. Whether you have discovered us on radio or found us online or on iTunes, week in and week out, we bring you the best of information to help your business grow. Joining us today is the founder of BrightIdeas.co, Trent Deersmith. His website and podcast highlight successful entrepreneurs sharing their best ideas. Thank you for helping fight the good fight. Welcome, Trent. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Lisa and Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Trent. I've seen you describe yourself as a serial entrepreneur. Give us some highlights of that. Sure. Do you want to talk about the failures or the successes? The failures far outnumber the successes, but I've been fortunate to have a few successes. Uh, I guess you could say my entrepreneurial career started, you know, I was really young and mowed lawns and did all the other stuff, but I started my first real business in 2001. Actually, no, that's not correct. I started one in 2000. Uh, around the dot com meltdown, and that one failed. We uh, we did not make any money. <laughs> we lost some money, and in the ashes of that, I started another one in two thousand and one called Durand, and it was up in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I'm from. Spent about eight years building that business uh, before I sold it for in two thousand and eight. And during that period of time, we got to a few million dollars in revenue, about a dozen employees. We were recognized as one of the fastest. Uh, 100 growing companies in Canada for two years in a row. So that was pretty cool. And then I was also fortunate enough to be uh, recognized as one of the top 40 under 40 business people in Vancouver. And I I did all that stuff, to be honest with you, because I wanted to get as much social proof for me and my company as I could. Because when we would go and talk to new customers, it made it a lot easier to get customers when they would see that your company was winning awards. So sold that uh, in the fall of 2008. I had my a mini retirement move from uh, the Pacific Northwest down here to San Diego. Learned, bought a surfboard, grew my hair long or relatively long down to my eyebrows, <laughs> and uh, spent my time surfing and riding my dirt bike and pondering what I wanted to do next. And uh, started Bread Ideas a couple of months ago. Wow. You're so creative, though, and I can tell has so much energy. I don't think you could retire. You're so young. <laughs> yeah, no, I was never. You need to keep busy. Yeah, I was never bored. And I, I, I did, I mean, I'm in the interest of time. There right. were definitely other things that I did and failed at during oh. that period of time, I might add. I did actually have another business before Bright Ideas that was online, and it was quite successful mm-hmm. for a time, but it was really dependent upon Google's algorithm, and then they changed it. And- oh, right. You're, you're also an advocate of failing in business because of the invaluable learning that occurs. Tell us about one of those failures and what it taught you. Well, I guess the story I was just alluding to there would be a terrific example okay. of that. I had built – so the girl that I met surfing, um, she was building these little websites and getting all this tr- free traffic from Google and making about $200,000 a year and only working about an hour a day. And I was kind of burned out from my business, <laughs> and I thought, hey, I want to do that. So I started building all these little sites, and right. they were making money, and, and then I started blogging about it, and then I started – building this training program and teaching other people how to do it. And then I assembled this team of staff in overseas and we were building all these websites for people and, and everybody was, uh, was, was doing okay in that business until the penguin and Panda updates came out. So the lesson there was I made the huge, I had a very poor strategy and I made the big mistake of being completely dependent upon Google, Google traffic in particular for my business's success. And when the traffic stopped, Uh, revenue dropped by about 80 percent. We asked you what advice you would give for someone to follow in your footsteps and you said fail fast and cheap. Yeah you see people it's it's very uncommon I think for people to succeed for me in particular Mm -hmm. to succeed in my first attempt. So if you do a business that the startup costs are so intense that you financially wipe yourself out on your first crash how do you come back and try again? You're you're going to have to go back and get a job and save up. It, it, it's devastating for people. And with that amount of financial risk, it's also extremely frightening for your first attempt. So the beautiful thing about building an online business is that it's very, very fast and inexpensive to test things. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to sell, you know, whatever, you could literally take WordPress, put up a sales page, put a buy button on it, go to Facebook buy 500 bucks worth of traffic, 
send the traffic to that sales page and see if it converts. Now, even if you don't have a product ready yet, when they click the button that that goes to buy, you just take them to a page that says, thank you very much. You know, the product's not ready yet. We really appreciate your interest. If you'd like to enter your email address here when we have the product ready, you know, we'll email you. Or you could say, you know, you could email everyone that bought it and you could say, hey, we're coming up with version two of the product. It'll be ready in 30 days. I'll either refund your money or you can wait until version two, even though version one doesn't even exist. <laughs> That's strategy. the best way to test a market is to get people to buy something. Surveys are great, but give me your money and then I know I'm in business. So because you've had successful businesses and not successful businesses, do you find people coming to you all the time with their ideas, creations, their startup ideas and wanting you wanting to get your help and feedback? It, it definitely happens as a byproduct of when you blog like I do or mm-hmm. when you host a podcast like I do, you know, your audience, just like your show, your audience grows over time and people will reach out to you. It, it's not that common yet, but every once in a while I do. Just the other day I got, you know, like the really long email explaining. And <laughs> and I'm at this point in time I do have the time I do reply to most of those emails. But the people I don't reply to are the people who, you know, my life has come crashing down <laughs> and everything is bad and I need to make $5,000 by next week because I, right. I can't, I, I'm not right. a psychologist. I can't help those people. <laughs> so people should go to learn more about you to brightideas.co. And I want to point out that your website is really the initial landing page, but the main content lies beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. The landing page is there um, because if you're, if you run a website, you need to be collecting email addresses because it's the number one most valuable asset that you're going to build. So that page that you see is called a splash page. And I'm actually just in the process of making some changes. I had hoped to have them live in time for this recording, but they won't be. So, but people, they don't have to put their email address in right in little faint letters underneath the box. It says, or skip to website. So you can still get through to all of the content. It's all for free. That splash page is by the way, very successful at get, getting email addresses. I get 67% of all my email addresses from that. That's a great strategy. Let's talk about your podcast. They are one-on-one interviews with entrepreneurs. How do you select your guests? I look for people who, so I have a specific audience that I'm really interested in creating content for, and that audience is marketing agency owners and professional marketers at a brand. And the reason for that is I'm building software, which is a separate business, Mm -hmm. and I want a big list of prospects for that software. So when it comes to guest selection, most of the time I'm looking for people who I think that my audience will be interested in. They either are a very successful marketing agency owner or they're a consultant to marketing agencies, or they've written a book that would be of interest, or they have a case study that's related. But every once in a while, I find somebody that I interview purely for my own interests and whether my audience likes it or not, I don't really care. Oh, I love that. That's fun. I've done that with with musicians. Some of my favorites, uh, Brian has been like, okay, Lisa, this is purely for you. And and you have, you have to have fun at what you do. You do. And the other thing is that you're going to find that people that listen to your show some portion of them are just, they're really connected to you and they, they share your interests and your beliefs. And when you interview that maybe different guest that doesn't quite fit, they're going to love it as well. So I don't ever have any guilt over it. Plus it's free. So if you don't like it, you don't have to listen. <laughs> Who is your ideal interviewee? My ideal interviewee? Um, well, there's a couple. It's someone who's running a really successful marketing agency because I love to get them to tell the story of how they built their agency. Because I know I have a lot of people who are at like one person, two people, three people, and they're dying for information on how to grow their agency. Um, I also really enjoy uh, interviewing people who uh, have written books that I've read, for example, that I just found, like I interviewed a guy by the name of Mike Miklowitz. He wrote, wrote this book. I plug Mike so often, I should swear he should owe me some money. I'm going to have to tell him about this. Anyway, he wrote a book called the, about the Pumpkin Plan. Uh, great book. I loved the book. He was in the same industry as me, and he was far more successful than I was because of his pumpkin plan. I just wish I would have read his book sooner. So when I read it, I reached out to him. And I said, Mike, you got to be on my show. And we had a great time. But he's, you know, he doesn't, he's not in the marketing agency space. Quick synopsis. What is the pumpkin plan? So when pumpkin farmers grow these 2,000-pound pumpkins, so he really took a study of that. And basically it comes down to a couple of key principles. Number one is start with the right seed. So you can metaphorically say that the seed is a problem to solve in business because if you don't have a problem to solve, you're not in business. And then the other really important thing was those farmers, and this is true, they go and prune everything else off of the vine so that all of the energy can be focused on making that one massive pumpkin. 
So if you think about it in business, most people, and I was like this when we start a business, we'll take anybody as a customer because we're so desperate for cash flow. We just need to pay the bills, right? right. If you keep doing that, within about year three, you'll, 80, you'll find out. 80% of Pareto principle. You're going to find 80% of your revenue coming from 20% of your customers. Mm. And those other 80% of your those customers, they are sucking the life out of you, your business, your employees. So you need to prune them off. Good advice. Sometimes your guests really achieve an aha moment on air as you discuss their methods and challenges. What have been some success uh, stories and interviews you've had besides the pumpkin plan? I guess what we'll, what I'll answer to that is, is like a go- I call them golden nuggets. So I did an interview with a guy by the name of Jeremy Shepard, and he runs a website called pearlparadise.com. And in the interview with Jeremy, there was, I'd say, three or four really big, uh, kind of like, because I'm taking notes when I'm doing the interview, stuff that I like really circled on my pad of paper. Um, so I think that's probably the best example uh, of, uh, and I get probably at least one aha out of every interview. You talked about a gentleman you interviewed and he was doing a million dollars a year and then you went off air and spent time with him. Yeah, this was uh, this was a guy who... Um, sells. So he started a business where he sells billboard advertising. And my producer had found him. And so I was looking at the producer's notes, much like what you guys have here. And then I looked at his website and his website was so bad that I almost (laughs) didn't want to interview him because I thought, oh, this guy's just must be a hack. And so I, we got on to do the interview and I found out that he was doing over a million bucks a year. And so we did the interview and he explained to me how he'd got you know, successful and, and, and what was working for him. Right. And I thought, well, this is a smart guy and he knows a lot about selling billboards, but he doesn't know Jack Diddley about running the back end of his business. And I really felt for him because I knew that I used to be like that. Right. And so when we got off air, I said, you know, would it be okay with you if I gave you a, some advice? And he said, yeah, I would love it. And so I said, well, you know, first of all, you got to fix your website because it's really horrible and it's not helping you. And then what are you doing here? And then and, and he explained to me how the, the prospecting process. And he put like eight hours of research in before he would send a single email. And his, he'd convert 95% of those emails. So it was really effective, but eight hours. So I said to him, well, you know, why isn't, couldn't you make that into a checklist? Couldn't you hire someone in the Philippines for five bucks an hour to do that for you? And he said, yeah, I guess I just never thought of that. I said, well, you know, how much of an impact do you think that would have on your productivity? He goes, well, big. So that kind of thing was the stuff that we talked about. A great story. Like us, I'm sure that you learn from every guest you interview. So you are personally building a collective knowledge about business through these sessions. Absolutely. I it, think it's fun. It is fun. I, I, I love doing this stuff. I love talking about business. And you're right. I think uh, it's probably why you do this show, because every guest I have on, I get to learn some stuff from. Are you like us in that you're consuming a tremendous amount of business knowledge through the process of your show? For example, while tons of consultants say they can, we actually are getting top listings on Google for business in a matter of days. Uh, Search radio advertising OC or radio advertising Orange County, and you'll see. It's astonishing as we apply the things we learn from our guests Mm -hmm. by simply listening to our own show. Do you find yourself applying all All of these principles you learn in getting remarkable results in different areas of business? You know, I wish I could use the word all, but I'm going to have to say some. And and that's simply just uh, a reflection of constrained resources. I get more more bright ideas are given to me than I'm able to put into effect because I simply don't have enough time. one of you. Correct. Well, there's more than one of me. Actually, there are others that help me with the show. But, but there's uh, only one brain, and it's hard to clone yourself. But correct. it's great to hear that you have a good team. So where do you want your business to be three to five years from now? Well, the main business is the software business that we really haven't talked about. And three to five years from now, I expect to have already sold that company for hopefully more than $10 million. Are you going to retire then? Uh, no. No. I don't no. think you have that in you. <laughs> no, probably not. You've said that the number one problem that gets in people's way when starting a business is that they just don't have an idea. Yeah. And actually, Corey and I were talking about this, and you need me to go quick. The biggest thing with, with finding an idea is it's unlikely that you're ever going to just brainstorm an idea. The way to get an idea is to go ask people, what's what problems do you have in your business? And then look for solutions to those problems. Well, our shows are similar in nature. They are different in content and format, but together we can give listeners a well-rounded business education. What are more things that you want to offer in your show, Trent? Just actionable ideas. Theory is great, but I want people to listen to an episode 
and be able, if they're listening in their commute, I want them to be able to get to their office. And because they, they sent themselves an email in the middle of that episode about some idea, some bright idea that they heard, I want them to be able to put that into action that day and make a difference in their business. So we've been talking with Trent Deer Smith from brightideas.co, not .com, brightideas.co. To learn more about Trent, go to the businessexperienceshow.com. You are listening to the Business Experience Show on Sports Radio AMA 30 KLAA. Sports Radio AMA 30.